Hey, hey, and welcome to another episode of Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. Thank you so much for pulling your chair up to the cool kids table. We are now into the year 2020. I hope that your year is starting off very well. And one of the things I know I'm doing with my small business is I'm really focused this year on sales. Uh, I found out, you know, the hard way after working for myself for 11 years that when you have good sales, things are easier. When sales are in the tank, life gets a lot harder. So I think that any entrepreneur really has to pay attention to this. And that's why I have a special guest on today who is an expert in sales. That's what he does. He actually has a background working for companies as a SVP of sales and a chief revenue officer. But a couple of years ago, he actually walked away from all that and has gone in feet first, head first maybe, to uh, really being a teacher and a trainer about transparent transparency around the sales. And my friend Jake actually saw him speak and said, you have to interview this guy. And I love it when somebody's that passionate about somebody. And I reached out to Todd Capone and I said, would you be on Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do? And his answer was, of course I will. So here we are today. Welcome to the show, Todd Capone. Thank you for having me. Can't wait to get into it. So Todd, I don't read bios and such. I like people to kind of give us their background. What is your background and how did you get to where you are today? Well, I am a, a multi-time head of sales. I, uh, I kind of label myself as kind of like a B, B minus sales rep um, that always knew that his passion was for leading and teaching. And I've been a, a total nerd for sales methodology and philosophy, which is a really weird thing to be a nerd about. Um, but, uh, you know, by way of background, my, my last role, I was the chief revenue officer of a company in Chicago called Power Reviews. And then before that, um, maybe some of your listeners have heard of a company called Exact Target, um, but I was on the sales leadership team there. We built it up, we IPO'd, and then Salesforce bought us for a meager $2.7 billion back in 2013. I hope you had um, some stock options. Yes. Uh, yeah, I had a little. I had, yeah, it was not, not that high of leadership, but uh, enough to make it uh, a valuable exit. So, uh, but yeah, and then, you know, a couple of years ago, I got this idea for the book and I felt like it had to be written. And it, you know, I thought there was a 50-50 chance that it would suck because I'd never written a book before and it's been on fire and it's, uh, it's become a full-time business for me and I don't foresee myself going back into the corporate world anytime soon. So what is the name of the book? Let's make sure everybody is quite aware. Yeah, I'm, if anybody's able to see this, it's called The Transparency Sale. Um, and it literally, if you can see, it's got a transparent cover. So oh, very clever. my designer did an amazing job with that. And um, yeah, it was uh, via Idea Press Publishing. And I, I'd be happy to tell you the concept because it's a bit counterintuitive if you'd like to hear that. Yeah, of course. Let's, what is the transparency sale? Tell us. Yeah. So here's the story. Um, I was Chief Revenue Officer of Power Reviews. And what you might be able to tell from its name, Power Reviews helps retailers and brands collect and display ratings and reviews on their website. So you're on crocs.com and you're looking at a pair of shoes, you look at the reviews underneath, and that was power reviews that was helping the collect and display part. So here's what happened. Um, so I had a team of about 60 people at the time, and uh, we did a research study with Northwestern University. And they were looking at how consumers interact with a website when a website is essentially acting as a salesperson, like an e-commerce site would. And what they found changed my whole life, as you can tell. Uh, you know, number one, no surprise, uh, we all look at reviews now. So that was no shock. 96% of us look at reviews before we buy something of medium to high consideration that we haven't bought before. I haven't found the 4% that don't yet. But the two things that blew my mind, Number one, 82% of us go right to the negative reviews first. So we don't want to read the fives because that's just marketing speak, right? Like I can read the product description. I want to see what people didn't like. And when a review score on a product, its average is between a 4.2 and a 4.5, those products sell at a higher rate than a product in any other score, including a five, meaning a 4.2 sells better than a five. And so I started to look at this and go, all right, this is when a website is acting as the salesperson. What happens when a human being is uh, in a B2B type sale or whatever? Uh, does the same logic apply? Does the same science apply? And so I started digging into the neuroscience and I, I figured it out that yes, when we lead with transparency and lead with our flaws 
and sell as though we're a four, two to a four, five, like literally sales process magic happens that sales cycles speed up, win rates go up. We start to work the deals that we should be winning. We stop working the deals we shouldn't because we lose those fast. And then we make it really hard on our competitors to compete against us. And the book is really an amalgamation of the, the research. And then the fact that now there's reviews proliferated on everything we do buy and experience anyway. So we've got to lead with our flaws because we can't expect to get away with it if we don't. And uh, then makes practical applications to how we position, prospect, present, negotiate, and even serve our customers long-term. And that, that's essentially what the book is all about. And it seems to be doing really, really well. So, so that's really fascinating to me because in, in I make my living as now part of what you do as well is I make my living as a speaker, right? So I go to conferences and I speak. And it's so interesting how many of our peers only talk about like how kick-ass they are on stage. And nobody ever talks about that time when they went where it just, you know, the audience didn't gel. And I always joke with people who say, oh, I've never bombed. I always say, that's so interesting. You're either lying or it's coming. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't, think, I don't think you can put yourself out there in any type of public thing, whether you're a product or a service and, and be everything to all people. So I think you're onto something that's, that's really quite interesting. And a year and a half ago, I took up stand-up comedy. I was 51 years old. I'd always wanted to do it when I was a kid. I started doing open mic nights. I've now been invited into several shows as a, as a sort of what they call a featured comic or whatever. I'm not great by any means. I'm certainly, uh, Jerry Seinfeld is not worried about job security because I did this. <laughs> but if you really look at comedy as a, as a mirror for the business world, comics bomb all the time. Jerry Seinfeld bombs. They go to these open mic nights, they try new material and the audience is like, really? And that is how they get good is they admit, they know that that's part of the process. Not being perfect is part of the process. And it's how you get to the point that you're going to be fabulous. So does that sort of line up with what you're teaching? Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, it's the deals that we screw up, the companies that we screw up, the times that we bomb that are the, the things that we need to kind of cultivate to figure out what our messaging should be. And this is what I mean by that. Like when you talked about the example of being a speaker, um, you know, what I know is that I, I do best when I'm talking about uh, transparency and as it relates to prospecting, presenting, uh, positioning, those types of things. I sometimes have a customers that come to me and say, hey, we need a prospecting class. All right, I've got like three recommendations for you. Like that's not me. A part of the whole idea of transparency is knowing what you're good at and knowing what you're not. And so when you bomb, trying to understand, all right, here's the circumstances by which I've just bombed or screwed up. And then when a customer comes to you, a potential customer, just making sure that those aren't the scenario that's going to cause you to bomb. So, um, so with any company, for example, um, the one example I always give is Ikea. You know, I Ikea to me is amazing because it's the number one furniture retailer in the world for eight straight years. Yet, you would think if you were a furniture retailer, you'd be able to crush them, right? Um, I mean, they, it, you've got to go through this labyrinth to find what you're looking for. Once There's you only do, one of them in the city, you got to drive 45 minutes to get there. Yeah, and the parking lot is nuts. Um, and you finally find what you're looking for. There's no salesperson around. You got to write down the code or take a picture of it with your phone because you're going to the warehouse to put it onto a cart that doesn't have brakes and it probably weighs 4,000 pounds jam it into your car, get it home, open the box. There's 150 parts that don't have any uh, words on the instructions and you swear your way through it. And then when you're done, you're like, oh, we should have bought the end tables with this set, right? Let's go back. It, it doesn't make sense. But what Ikea tells the world is, listen, we're not going to be good at those things. So we can be great at our core, which is giving you modern Scandinavian design furniture that you didn't pay much for. And so when you think about your listeners, what are the things you're giving up to be great at your core? Embrace those. What are the times that you've screwed up in a customer scenario? Or, you know, to your point, you bombed, right? Like start to collect that kind of stuff and go, all right, what's going to optimize me for the greatest possible outcome for my customers? And that's my focus. And let's find as many of those instead of trying to be all things to all people. You know, Ikea does it great. Southwest Airlines does it great. I, there, there's a number of uh, organizations that have embraced this idea that, hey, we're not going to be everything. We're going to be really good at one thing. And if that's what's most important to you, we're awesome for you. And if it's not, there might be some other options. And that, that's the concept of this whole 
uh, where I think the future of sales is going anyway, uh, is we've got to embrace it regardless. But the brain science tells us that it optimizes our ability to sell. So let's give some tips to the listeners. So let's use a business like mine or yours as an example. I'm a solopreneur. I've got just me. I've worked for myself for 11 years and uh, I need to grow my sales in 2020. What should I be doing? Well, I think the first thing to think about, and it's something that I I have a part-time job and uh, my part-time job is I actually am the managing director of an incubator, a tech incubator in Chicago, focused on early stage tech companies. And what I find- Which which one? It's called Venture Scale. Okay. Yeah. And it's it's focused on early stage tech companies. And the focus is solely on revenue and sales, you know, giving them the foundation to be able to build that out. The thing that's funny though, is so many of these entrepreneurs think, you know what, I'm really good at delivering product or good at what I do. I got to start selling. They think that they've got to put on a plaid jacket and some gold chains and like show a little uh, chest hair and become this cheesy sales guy. But, you know, as it turns out, authenticity sells better than perfection anyway. And so I think that's the first thing that all of your listeners should come to grips with is just be you. Uh, being you is something that we all sense and that we all know. And as buyers, just think about who we like to deal with. And when somebody gives us a clear picture, remember that 82% stat from earlier when, hey, here's the things that maybe you're not going to like. And if you're cool with those, here's the things that we're great at. I, I think that that allows all of you to be your authentic self, but you'll find that the results on the back end are magic. So start to figure that out. You know, I, I think that's step one, figure out what you're not great at, what environments you're not great at and embrace those as part of your positioning. So, all right. So I embrace what I'm great at and what I'm not so great at. So now I'm going to focus obviously on the ones I'm great at because I don't want to sell to the people where I might come in less than a 4.2. Yep. So, you know, w- what do I need to do next? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of things. Um, there's one of the things that's so interesting about what I've dug into here is the brain science. Um, it, it, there's a treasure trove of neuroscience around the way that we make decisions that has yet to make it into the sales or business world. I think the sales and business world is about uh, seven years behind all of this content. And so I think that getting a basic understanding of those pieces will just help you in everything you do. You know, that, that idea of leading with your flaws and transparency is just step one but it has so many applications to the way that you send emails, the way that you present. Um, I'll I'll give you a a presentation example. Um, You know, um, imagine you go to a party and uh, at the party, there's a a bunch of people standing around, you go into that group and there's one person that, one of my favorite comedians, by the way, is Brian Regan. Of course. Um, Yeah, he's fantastic. I don't know if you've ever heard him talk about the me monsters. Um, I don't remember. Yeah. So like a me monster is like you go to a party and there's one guy there that's talking about how great he is, right? Just me, me, me. I'm so great. Oh, look at my car. I've got this great job. I just went on this vacation in the Spanish Riviera, like all this stuff. Right. And you're annoyed by that. Uh, Like you want to get away from this dude as quickly as possible. But when we think about in the sales world, it's amazing to me how many sales reps I run into that are essentially me monsters for their company. And they, they get on the phone with a prospect and they're just like, this is why I'm great. I'm so great. I, you know, like you think about your speaking um, or my speaking, just like, oh, I just did a project for Salesforce and LinkedIn and aren't I awesome? And the customer is like subconsciously like, dude, like take it easy. All right, I got it. You're great. Um, I, like that's, that resistance to influence is a big barrier in our brain that filters every word that comes through when we start like that. And so most of our presentations are, this is why we're awesome. And did I mention how awesome we are? It, it, I, this is going to sound like crazy advice, uh, but look at reality makeover TV shows and see how they choreograph the way that they do their shows. And if you can take those elements and put it into your selling pursuits, I think you'd be surprised at the results. And I, I'll give you kind of the Cliff Notes version of what that means. You know, like reality makeover TV show. Like um, right now, I, I love Queer Eye. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Queer Eye is a fantastic one. Um, restaurant they're actually, and pop. They're actually filming their next season in Austin. They're going to be here for the next four months. So oh, nice. Trying, everyone in, in Austin's trying to have their Queer Eye sighting. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. So let's talk about Queer Eye for a second. Imagine if at the beginning of every episode, it was the, five, the Fab Five, who are these five guys who have expertise in one of five different categories, and they go kind of take a disheveled mess and turn them around in the, the series of a week, but it's one episode, right? Imagine if the beginning of every episode was the five guys talking about how awesome they are. Like, you'd stop watching. In every case, there's a participant that has raised their hand and said, hey, I could use some help. So they've self-identified they've got a problem or two, just like our customers, right? Our customers wouldn't be talking. It's not like we're barging in the conference rooms going, hey, you're a mess, right? Um, so they, they take this one person that's raised their hand. Very quickly, they disarm the person by being themselves, being their authentic self. And then they immediately go into an education around, hey, I know you realize that you've got a, an issue or two. Here's a couple of things that you didn't realize you're doing wrong, right? So they educate them around opening their eyes to this idea that their status quo, it's, while it's not good, it's really unsustainable too. And they go immediately into that. They back it up with emotion and, and logic, meaning the emotion is what happens if we don't fix this? And they talk a lot about why their lives are not where they want them to be. And then they back it up with logic. Here's why this works. And then they talk about, hey, here's what we're gonna do, right? If we did that in our selling pursuits where we started with, hey, here's why you brought us in. This is our understanding. Are we cool there? Disarming, like here's what we're not great at. But hey, the two things you mentioned, here's a couple other things that we see in your environment or companies like yours that maybe you haven't thought about. And here's the emotion around what happens if you don't address those. And here's some logic that backs up the reward if you do. And oh, by the way, here's how we would handle it. You just change that order from we, we, we to this is how great you can be. It not only tells a great story, but it compels the listener to action. And that's, that's what reality makeover TV shows do. They're all crying at the end and that's big success. That's what you want in your sales pursuits too. I know it's counterintuitive, but it's just something to think about. Well, let's say somebody relates to that and they're like, okay, I'm going about this backwards. I do go in with, you know, hey, look at all the great, I spoke for Salesforce, aren't I bitching? Uh, what, uh, what steps can people take to fix that? How do they, how, besides reading your book, what can they do? Yeah, I, I think it's as simple as, in, in the book, I go through a whole choreography, but in the, the absence of doing that, I just think about it in terms of, instead of starting with we, you write down on a piece of paper, A, an arrow, B. A is the customer's current state. B is the customer's future state. And in the middle is why A is no longer sustainable. Hmm. If you just write that on a piece of paper and go, all right, how do I tell my story, but fit it into this, where you start with A, the customer's current state, why that's no longer sustainable, and then lead to your, you know, what you would do and what the future state could potentially look like. That simple reordering of your slides or your presentation or the way that you position makes a huge impact on the buying brain tells a great story and it's very compelling to the listener because it makes you a consultant versus a salesperson. Awesome. Well, Todd, I've got a few more questions for you. We're not going to let you off the hook this easy. <laughs> First, I have to thank the sponsor of this episode. So this episode, it's brought to you by Podfly Productions. Podfly takes the time and the headache out of creating your own podcast. They set you up with the right equipment, training, and guidance to ensure that you're going to sound amazing Podfly does all the heavy lifting and the technical work so that you, you can focus on creating great content, growing your audience, and interviewing really cool people like Todd Capone. Hey, if you want to start a podcast, and I know that some of you do, jump over to podfly.net slash cool things and check out the offer that they have for the listeners of this show. So Todd, the people who listen to the show, a lot of them want to start businesses variety of industries and products and services. What advice do you have for someone who wants to start off on their own? I mean, you started off on your own a while back. What, what advice would you have? Yeah, it was funny. When I got this idea for the book, um, I went and talked to publishers and, um, you know, two of the three publishers said, hey, you need to quit your job to do this. And so I chose the third one. Then I started writing and a month in, I was like, I got to quit my job. Um, and so I ended up doing that anyway, and then jumping feet first into this whole build a business around this. Um, you know, year one for me was pretty reactive versus intentional because 
and there's so much excitement around it. As I move here into 2020, my goal is to be much more intentional. But I'll, my advice is, I, I'm going to give you some counterintuitive advice because I know you've got, like, I've listened to a few of the episodes. You've had so many great people on that give great advice. I'm going to give you one that's a little bit different. Um, the first thing I did in January of 2019 was give myself a quota. Like, I know that sounds crazy that, hey, you know what? I'm finally out of the work world. Like, you know, as a sales leader, I've always had a quota. Isn't the whole purpose of getting out to like not have that kind of pressure? But I, I needed to put that kind of pressure on myself. I needed to have a beacon that said, basically, my quota was, if I can't get to this sustainable revenue level and grow this thing, then I, I'm fired. Like I'm fired from my own business. So I gave myself a quota that said, you know, looked at what kind of revenue I needed to make the business sustainable without going out and getting a job. And, um, and then it grows. And as I look at those numbers and looked at Q3 and Q4, which were fantastic, my ability to hit those targets tell me, all right, do I double down on the business or should I go do something else? Or do I need to change directions? So having a quota, like how do you, how do you know that you're going where you want to go if you haven't laid out the map first? And so that's like the counterintuitive advice is give yourself a quota. I don't think it's counterintuitive at all. In fact, I host a thing called my sales call and I don't position myself as a sales expert, although my, my stuff that I talk about, about the performance gap and how people get from potential to performance, it's a sales talk. I mean, it's great for salespeople, but I don't consider myself like the guru of sales. Mm -hmm. However, on this call, what I did is I created a way, since I missed having a sales manager in a weekly call and someone holding me accountable to my quota and the actions I was going to take, I started a call for people who work for themselves, like a solopreneur weekly. Great idea. Where we get together and we talk about it. And this week, the topic was, do you have a quota for 2020? Just like if you had a real sales manager, they would tell you, this is what we expect either per month or per quarter. You know, are you doing that? Do you have, have, you, have you reversed engineer the thing? So I don't think it's counterintuitive at all. I think it's brilliant. Well, thank you. And I, I you know, I set up a full CRM. Um, I'm using Zendesk Cell, but I've got my pipeline built in. I've got stages. I can forecast, all right, am I going to hit my Q1? How is Q2 looking? Am I building up? Um, so all of the elements, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, the basics of sales are fundamental to your success or failure, uh, regardless what profession you come from. And I think if you're able to optimize those sailing skills, it's just going to make you so much more um, successful and then you know, feel like you're providing so much more value to your customers. So you and I both have a sales background before having our own businesses. And so that I think is an advantage for a lot of entrepreneurs, at least to have an understanding. Sometimes you know, when you go from a larger sales organization to working for yourself, it's, it's like, you know, going from college back to kindergarten. However, understanding the importance of sales, a lot of things a lot of people don't do. So for the entrepreneurs who don't have a sales background, what advice do you have? Well, I mean, I, I think that like we talked about with the authenticity, um, you know, just being yourself, like you don't have to be a cheese ball to be a successful salesperson. As a matter of fact, the opposite works so much better. So like, take it easy there. Um, there, there's one other area that entrepreneurs, I think, really struggle with, and it's this idea of negotiating. So when you establish your, pro, you know, your, your company and you've got products or services or you're giving talks or whatever, one of the things that has another counterintuitive type of positive impact is what I call transparent negotiating. Uh, but it's basically, you know, in my history of being a sales leader, it felt always like it was two different personalities. Uh, we needed a salesperson whose personality it was to build trust, right? Like we want to build trust and build a relationship. And then the customer at the end says, yeah, I'm going to go with you. And what do you do? You flip personalities and say, all right, cool. I'm going to start lying to you. And that's what negotiation is. And always drove me crazy. So I think there's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to um, embrace this idea of transparency around you, the way you negotiate. And essentially it's based on the four things you probably care most about. Um, you know, number one is volume. So how much product or service the person's buying from you. Number two is the timing of cash. So how fast the person pays. Number three is the length of commitment. So is it a one-time thing or is it a longer commitment? And number four is when they sign, uh, when they decide to go with you. And so if you go into a customer type of engagement 
and you lay out your pricing that way for the customer and say, hey, listen, my pricing, here it is. This is what it's based on. And the customer comes back to you and says, oh, you know what? We need to get that down by 15%. What do you do? Do you go, Tommy boy, okie dokie, and give it to them? Or do you say, hey, listen, there might be a way for us to get there. Remember those four things we talked about? Well, the percentage, we can get it down by committing to more, paying faster, committing longer, or help me forecast my business. There's value uh, in my ability to forecast my business, and I'll pay you in the form of a discount for those four things. When you do that, the customer then starts to negotiate their own deals, which is amazing. It's fully transparent, so you're building trust up through the goal line. Your deals become more predictable, especially if you're using that fourth layer uh, lever around the, the timing of the deal. And it gets you out of this business of feeling like you've got to be some kind of crazy hostage negotiator to be able to get the deals you want. Like, it's amazing that when you just have a structure and a framework for your pricing, how much you're able to hold to it much more effectively and customers don't even question it. So that, that's a, another tip that I hope helps everybody who's listening. No, oh, I, think, I think that's really good. Uh, you know, one of the things I've done with a couple of, of clients in, in trying to be transparent and everything else is when we kind of get to this little impasse, like you just think, is I often ask them, like, I'll have a number in my head that, yeah, I could do it for that. And I'll ask them, well, what do you think is fair? Mm -hmm. And it's awesome how often they come up with a higher number than I thought was fair. <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's like, I often ask, ask them, well, okay, you can't do what we talked about. Maybe if we back this out and that out, it, then it, we could, you know, you know, find a way to play. But, but if we did that, what do you think is a fair price? And I'm surprised how often that they come back with a price that's higher than I was willing to do. So it's like, let them, you know, if they think it's fair, it's fair. And if it's more than I'm willing to do, that's, that's a win-win. There you go. Yep. That's amazing. So uh, I ask everyone who comes on the show this question, because this is what I speak about. And I mm -hmm. talk to people about a lot of people have potential and they don't get anywhere. So potential to, unto itself isn't really worth anything if you're not taking the right actions. And so what we, what we discover is we have this performance gap. People have potential, they're not getting the results. How come you think some people are able to get farther across this gap and other people just fall into the abyss between potential and performance? Well, it depends on the circumstance. One of the things that I'm researching right now is the science behind motivation. Um, I, I, there's so much there too. And like, I, we could unpack that probably a, another episode, maybe but we'll, we'll have you back on the show and we'll talk about the science behind it. That's good. There you go. Exactly. I, I mean, I think it's fascinating um, how we think about motivation. There's, there's a um, neuroscientist named Dr. David Rock. And so I stole this total full credit to him, but he looks at the five things that drive engagement in individuals and engagement is what really correlates to whether or not somebody has that thirst for learning um, to really grow in their professions and wake up every morning really wanting to do something. His model is called the SCARF model, uh, but SCARF stands for, uh, the S is status, meaning we do things because we want status. We want validation, recognition. Um, we want to get good feedback for the things that we do. The C is certainty. Like we want to predict what our, our, our world's going to be like that day. And when we get certainty and predictability, we're highly engaged. The A is autonomy, meaning we want control. Uh, we, want to, we don't want to be micromanaged. We want the resources to, to get to what we want to accomplish. The R is relatedness, meaning we want to be a part of something. We want to be a part of a group. We want to be doing kind of higher order, higher order type stuff um, that means something. And then the F is fairness, meaning, you know, essentially is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the effort I'm putting in worth, um, you know, in terms of my time and my dollars worth what I'm getting back in return? If we as leaders, as entrepreneurs are able to optimize for those five, you'll find that the people that are around you are going to much more likely uh, succeed because they're going to be waking up every day excited to be doing what they're doing. And so for me, when I think in my past, when are the times where I've really accomplished what I think I should be able to and, and even more, it's when you've got balance on those five things. And so it, it's not just about, hey, I'm the cool boss and I pay you a lot. There's more that goes into it. And if we can just think about those things and optimize for them, I think you're going to find that people succeed more often underneath you. Awesome. Hey, I like to ask people before I let them go from the show, who they admire in the world of entrepreneurship? Because I think, Todd, we could talk about you and all the cool things you're doing in the world of sales and the transparency sale all day long. 
<laughs> but good entrepreneurs, they're observers. And I get answers everywhere from my corner dry cleaner to Elon Musk and everything in between. Yeah. So when you look out there at the world of entrepreneurship, who does Todd Capone say, wow, that's the person, he or she are doing the cool stuff. Yeah, I, uh, it's funny when I think about the cool stuff, because I've listened to your episodes before, so I was prepared. Um, you know, I was thinking about, you're, I mean, obviously you remember Ronald Reagan. Um, Ronald Reagan had the coolest life ever, right? He was a Cubs broadcaster at baseball, and then he became a world famous actor, um, you know, married his beautiful co-actress that he worked with. Um, and then he became- Two of them. Two of them, that's right, that's exactly right. And then he, um, you know, he became president of the United States. And I'm like, wow, that guy, man, he had it all. Now, obviously that's not, I, I'm, not I'm not on that path. So I think about like in my world, there, there's a guy that's recently written a book called Never Split the Difference. And his name is Chris Voss. And uh, I think he's fascinating, like absolutely fascinating individual. Um, he was a former FBI hostage negotiator. The book is fascinating. The stories about, you know, bank heists and all that kind of stuff. But this guy has gone from being an FBI hostage negotiator to writing a best-selling book that like everybody I know has read and I love it. Uh, he's, uh, you know, done TED Talks. He's been on TV shows. His business is exploding like within two years. And I just look at him and I'm like, I, I'm, I, I gotta say, I'm a little jealous. This guy's got it. And so uh, Chris Voss is a guy that I think is an incredible follow. And it, it, the book is definitely worth uh, the read too. I, I'm a big fan. Awesome. And then the final question I have for everybody is what do you do to give back to the greater good? Cause I think, you know, making money is awesome, but it's not the whole thing. I think that as entrepreneurs, if we're fortunate and we're fortunate, we have to find a way to, to, to leave a little, a little something behind. So, so what do you do? Well, I, I'm not as intentional as I should be in that regard, but um, I don't want to leave everybody on a sad note, but there's, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, I, about five years ago, uh, we, we've got lots of dogs. So we've got rescue dogs and cats here. Uh, I've got three dogs, two cats, all rescues. And so I, I guess that's part of it. Um, we, had, we had gone on vacation five years ago, boarded our three dogs, and the boarding facility lost one. Um, and so from, we were at Disneyland, we were literally walking in and the boarding facility called and said they lost them. And we still haven't found them. Um, we have been, you know, obviously he's a family member to us. So that was a really hard time. But the one thing that we're doing, my stepdaughter, who's 15, is taking on this initiative and starting basically a, a 501c3 around it, which is educating people around microchips and that lost dogs are not really unwanted. There is a perception out there that you find a lost dog and the, your kids are like, can we keep it? They're like, yeah, we can keep it. It's sweet. Well, it's probably somebody's family member and they're desperately searching for it. And so one of the things that we're really trying to be more intentional about is what can we do to educate the masses that a lost dog is not an unwanted dog and what steps you should take to help reconnect that pet with their potential owner. So um, that my, my uh, stepdaughter calls it um, finders, not keepers. Uh -huh. And uh, so she's, we've established a, a website we're building right now. It's findersnotkeepers.org. And uh, we're, we're starting to do a lot more around that. You know, I think that's wonderful for a couple of reasons. Obviously, you know, to, to many people, their pets are their family. And so being able to reunite people like that is, is doing that and helping to sort of re-educate the population is in, on a lot of topics is such a good thing. But the cooler thing is you've got your 15-year-old stepdaughter involved in realizing that if you want to fix something, you know, you can't just sit back and say, go fix it. You have to find your way to put your two cents into it. So absolutely. Yeah. Money, effort, the whole thing. So I think that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for Thank sharing you. that, Todd. Thank you. So any last words for people before we say goodbye? I'll just leave everybody with the, the mantra that I think matters for not only the current state, but the future state of sales. And it's this idea that transparency sells better than perfection. And so um, I, I will, I'll leave you with a word that was coined by supermodel Tyra Banks, which I know sounds crazy, but Tyra coined the great, term- The great philosopher. The great philosopher, Tyra Banks, who coined the term flossom. Uh, and it's this idea of embrace your flaws, but know that you're still awesome. We all know that nothing is perfect. And if we think about ourselves and our businesses as being flossom and position it that way, magic happens. And I can't wait to hear 
how uh, everybody's efforts to go try this works out. That is fantastic. And thank you for being part of Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, the most flossom podcast on the internet. <laughs> thank you. So Todd, if people want to find you, they want to find your book, they need you to come and speak to their company. How do they locate Todd Capone? Yeah, I mean, I'm all over uh, spreading my nonsense on LinkedIn. So I encourage you to follow or connect with me there. Uh, the website is transparencysale.com. It's also toddcapone.com if you forget. And the book is available pretty much anywhere books are sold. And if you want the audio book version and want the sultry sounds of Todd Capone coming through your car speakers, I did record that myself as well. Nice. Very nice. Well, Todd, again, thank you so much. I'm going to have to ping Jake and tell him thank you for the introduction because this was a great episode full of lots of useful information for the listener. And I say it every time. Thank you to everybody who listened because if it wasn't for the audience, why would we even have the show? Uh, do me a favor. If you like the show, go leave those reviews on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast love. Uh, but more importantly, uh, tell a friend. When I meet people who say they like the show, I always ask them, how did you hear about it? And almost every time someone says, my sister listens, my brother, my mom, my neighbor. Somebody said this was a good listen for my commute or when I go running or whatever it is I do. So if you like the podcast, tell a friend because that's how we grow. Hey, we're going to be back in a couple of days with an interview with somebody just as cool as Todd Capone. And you're thinking, Tom, that is impossible. How will you find somebody as cool as Todd Capone? But we do it every single time, twice a week. So uh, tune in and check out what we got going forward. But in the meantime, go out there, be authentic, be transparent. Beef, what was it? Floss Flossum. Flossum. I was gonna say yes. flotastic. That's my word. That's my <laughs> I just kind of coined that one. Be flossum. Uh, but while you're out there, keep trying new things. You're not gonna be awesome at everything, but you're not gonna know where you're gonna excel unless you try it. And while you're doing that, have a great day.